Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's my pleasure to introduce Dhruva Bortakur from Facebook. So Dhruva and I go back a long time, actually. We were both grad students in Wisconsin 14 years ago. So, um, so Dhruva is now at Facebook, but he started out uh, in a variety of startups. And uh, he's the principal architect of the Hadoop uh, distributed file system. He started out doing that at Yahoo. And then he moved over to Facebook. And he's been there the last couple of years. And he's going to tell us about Hadoop and how it's being used in Facebook. So, Truba? Cool, thanks. Can you guys hear me? Cool. So, thanks for inviting me, first of all, Trishul and everybody else. Um, I work at uh, Facebook for the last two years or so now. Uh, it's kind of a small company still compared to the previous companies I'd worked for, like Yahoo and stuff like that, it's much bigger. And here I'll talk a little bit about, kind of, uh, give a little bit introduction to like how Hadoop started, um, like why it started, and like maybe some pause-outs that happened in the beginning. And then I'll talk a little bit about like how the distributed file system is kind of structured. Um, so Hadoop is actually like different parts, and I'm going to like focus on one part only. But please feel free to ask me questions about other things that are in Hadoop. Um, if I know them well, I will explain other stuff to you too. Otherwise, I will refer you to some other persons that I know. Uh, also, please feel free to ask me questions in the middle. Just say stop and ask me a question instead of keeping everything to the end. I'd like to like, get more questions in the middle and make it more interesting, if I can. Um, so that's the introduction. So I'll give a slight introduction about like, how Hadoop started, uh, and then talk a little bit in details about the distributed file system that we have inside Hadoop. And then I'll uh, talk a little bit about the uh, kind of the infrastructure we have in Facebook. Uh, this is more at the infrastructure level, like kind of machines and the pipelines you have, and doesn't talk much about applications. <clears throat> so has anybody like played around with Hadoop, uh, or like downloaded Hadoop, or like read about Hadoop maybe, uh, like design docs or something else? Cool. So, uh, so um, I have been working. So I started working at Hadoop when I started working at Yahoo. Uh, that was the time when Yahoo was. Um, doing everything kind of like the fault tolerance and uh, the scalability, all these things were packaged inside each Yahoo application. There wasn't like a separate framework to do this. So all the Yahoo properties that were there, search, maps, finance, everybody used to do their own fault tolerance. There's a separate application for them. And they used to do their own scalability. And they can't scale each and every application like two uh, separately. It takes a lot of effort. So that was the time when uh, Yahoo decided to do the Hadoop project. And uh, due to various reasons, uh, it was decided that it will be done in like open source community. And that's when I joined Yahoo and started working on the Hadoop file system. <clears throat> mm. uh, so uh, like how did uh, the thing that I see, uh, uh, the, the reason why we started uh, a distributed uh, storage system and a distributed computing system is that we see that there is these requirements where people want to access their data uh, via the file interface, which has been there like for the last 30 years, right? File, read, write, open, create, delete. There's a big set of applications which want it. And of course, there are other big set of applications which want to access data based on some queries. Uh, they would rather not know where the data is. I mean, it's kind of a, um, the way I see it is that you, run a query saying that give me all this data which matches these things. It doesn't matter where it's stored. So that's, so those two APIs are, getting, are kind of getting merged in this, uh, in, in this, uh, in this Hadoop project. Uh, and of course, um, at Yahoo and even at Facebook, I see that a lot of people uh, would like to keep their data in a format that they kind of know, in the sense that uh, if they put it in like an Oracle database or a Teradata database, uh, you still cannot get to the raw data mm, when you need to. Uh, so you always have to go through the proprietary data formats that are there. So here what happens is uh, you could access the data at different levels. So you could go to the file system and access the data. You could go to the database layer and access the data. You could even go to the storage layer and access the data, or even the raw disks, because the format is well known, right? It's open source. 
And uh, um, the other thing is that many times when we store this data in this big database, I'm calling it a database, but we'll, we'll try to figure out whether it's a database or not. Uh, we want like flexible schema. Most of the time we just dump stuff without actually knowing what is in there. And the same piece of data is interpreted different ways by different applications. Some guy would look at it as like a three columns of data. Some other guys would look at it as like one string and look, do other kind of processing. So it's the same data format with different schemas. <clears throat> and uh, the other thing which has been a pain kind of for our, for our infrastructure team is that nobody wants to delete most of this data. They want to keep it forever. Uh, the request is always to keep it forever. I mean, there's a cost to keeping it. But the thing is that people, at least the data sets that we deal with, they don't want to delete any data. They said, no, keep it. I'll, I might need it next year, or I might need it next month. So those things um, have created this thing that uh, we need like a huge database, which you should be able to query, you should be able to use file system interfaces, and you need flexible schemas. And of course, when you are talking about the scale, uh, of course, we need like a lot of fault tolerance built into the system so that the applications don't have to figure out their fault tolerance by themselves. And that's where kind of um, the Hadoop is born, where we wanted to m merge all these trends and get like um, a big piece of infrastructure which is separated out from the applications. Question? Delete data. There is also no versions. Every new version is new data. OK, so uh, that right now depends on the application. So there is no versioning built into Hadoop, per se. Uh, but uh, like I will explain a little bit later, so files are kind of write once, so you'd have to build versioning on top of it to get this semantics of never delete data. So essentially, you just keep on putting new files or new directories or new data sets. Does that answer your question? Um, so, uh, so when we started, we did experiment with some commercial databases. Uh, and we saw that uh, there are some limitations on the sizes of the database that we could try. Like 30, 40, 50 terabytes is what you kind of get good commercial databases to work well. Uh, if you look for even bigger warehouses, those are like go up to like 500 terabytes. Maybe some guys might actually go to a terabyte, or like one petabyte. But we're actually looking at much bigger data sets. And like I said, um, we need um, like a system where it's fault tolerant, because if you are talking about a huge set of machines, we want to make sure that the system takes care of this machines going down or networks going down. Whereas typical databases or warehouses, even though they're big, they're vertically scaled. So if some pieces fail, the kind of the database uh, performance sucks and things fall apart. And uh, open source Apache license so that like the community kind of, kind of benefit from doing stuff in open source. Um, so. Lately, so Hadoop started like three, five, four years back. That's when I started. But lately, in the last two years, there has been a lot of controversy. Controversy in the sense that like people asking questions, what is this? Is this really useful? Is it like really a piece of useless junk? Right? So there's these different extremes. Um, um, David, uh, who is from Wisconsin, where I, where I did my grad, uh, he published a paper which says, or, 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 or like a blog post, which says like a, giant step backward in programming paradigm. It's like completely, should all be done in the database. So that, 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 that is a valid opinion. I mean, those are all opinions that I'm kind of pointing out here. And then Stonebreaker kind of uh, compared VertigaDB with DBMX and Hadoop, and said that Hadoop is, uh, doesn't perform as well as DBMX, which is expected. Correct. So these things are very good in general, because it's like comparing different uh, ways of solving the same problem. Uh, then, of course, there are these parallel databases where you could probably scale up to like a terabyte or like a petabyte or so, or five petabytes or so. Uh, and there, what happens is <clears throat> they are all vertically scaled, like I mentioned, right? So when uh, different pieces of this of this of this um, um, cluster doesn't work well, then your performance suffers a lot, and it's not built in to do that stuff. So the only the my response to some of these things is that. Um, performance definitely is not as good in hardware uh, in Hadoop, and the, that, that that is because the goal is that the first goal is scalability and fault tolerance, and the second goal is performance. Whereas most of most other uh, databases or even parallel databases, the key or the primary goal is performance. So, like even um, Stonebreaker and uh, company when they do benchmarks, 
that actually do only performance benchmarks. And I really like the research community, which I've been talking to many universities these days, is to develop benchmarks to do fault tolerance. How to measure fault tolerance? Uh, simple example would be like maybe um, keep killing machines when you're running your query, or make some networks go slowly when you're running your query. That's the, that's the time when you'll see the power of Hadoop. Um, so, so whatever um, research, research has been done till now, I think it's all valid. But I think they're kind of focused in the wrong direction. <clears throat> I think it's very important is like these parallel databases are very expensive as well. So yes. cost is a big factor. Cost is a pretty big factor, but in Hadoop also I think, the, like I said, since we don't uh, focus on performance, we give up probably around 20% of cost to performance. So, I mean, there is this trade-off, right? For example, as far as storage is concerned, if I take Hadoop storage versus, say, filers from NetApp or somebody else, um, the cost is not that different. Right, because Hadoop replicates it in three places. Uh, but the fault tol tolerance and scalability is awesome. And the fact that you can just keep sliding in storage, whereas in NetApp filers, when you have, like in our company, we have lots of NetApp filers. And when one filer fills up, you have to run to make sure the data is like physically moved from, to, from one machine to another. There's a lot of operation cost. And there's a lot of advantage in pooling storage and scaling it out. <clears throat> Uh, so this is how Hadoop started. Uh, Google published a paper, uh, talked about GFS, and after that they talked about MapReduce. Um, and some people in the open source community, one person named Doug Cutting, uh, who, who actually started uh, Lucene open source project, he started this Hadoop project outside of Yahoo. And then uh, I joined Yahoo, and then he also moved to Yahoo. So there is this, Yahoo kind of started building up this team to do Hadoop. Um, probably took around like, one and a half years or two years to get it to like a, a thousand node cluster um, at Yahoo. And now there is this petabyte to sort and the terabyte sort that, that the industry uh, has benchmarked. And Hadoop has been winning that consistently for the last two years or so. <clears throat> uh, who uses, yeah, question? Uh, when you say Hadoop has been winning the, the petasort in, in, for the last two years, uh, does Google compete in that? Yes, so Google also published a paper. Uh, uh, so it's interesting, actually, right? The last year is the first year when Google actually started publishing their numbers. And they compared very close to Hadoop. And since the hardware was slightly different, there is, if you search in the web, you will find the hardware. And so the hardware is slightly different on this hardware that they have tested. So it is not very clear to me, but it's kind of in the error range. Both of them are kind of comparable there. Um, <coughs> Uh, so, quick rundown of some of the companies that I've seen use Hadoop. This I picked from the Powered By page in the Hadoop web page. There's like probably like 100 or 200 uh, entries there. I just picked a few uh, to kind of give some broad, uh, broad idea about who else is using Yahoo, uh, Hadoop. Um, so, what is Hadoop used for? Uh, we started using Hadoop at Yahoo with Yahoo Search. So, that's web search and indexing. Uh, that's where it started from. And even Facebook uses uh, stuff like that. Facebook also uses Hadoop for um, warehousing, so processing all the click logs from our Facebook website. We also use it for recommendation systems. So we like, look at patterns that, of user behavior and like, recommend his friends and stuff like that. I'll talk about that in some more detail. Uh, I've also seen people now use for video and image analysis. I've also used, I've also seen People uh, use it in like um, molecular biology and some more data crunching platforms recently. And I've heard that uh, some of the big financial companies in the East Coast have started kind of pre-production clusters of Hadoop, like 100 nodes, and experimenting with some new logic. So what I've seen is that um, most of the time when, app, when users or, app, or companies develop new applications, that's the time when they kind of start using Hadoop. And uh, not that existing applications are moving to Hadoop. I've never seen, like, uh, Yahoo Search is a different example, but most other companies, I haven't seen, like, existing applications move over to Hadoop. Most of the companies are trying to solve problems that they have not solved earlier. <clears throat> uh, public Hadoop clouds, uh, we can, you can use that in Amazon now. Uh, it's part of, it's supported by Amazon, uh, the Hadoop API, so you can very quickly set it up within a few minutes. Uh, IBM has been partnering with Google to give Hadoop 
uh, mostly to research and uh, research institutes and schools. And similarly, with Yahoo and HP and Intel have tied up and given you a cluster. Question? For the Amazon usage of Hadoop, do you have to import all of your data off of it? Yes. Okay. Yes. So the most so like like I said, I think most people who use Hadoop and Amazon are people who are actually hosting their application in Amazon because they generate their data there. Uh, I know about like one or two web companies who actually move their data from their data center to Amazon, but I believe they don't move it uh, through like internet. They actually send physical tapes. I do have a slight follow-up question. Do hmm? people move it out of S3 and into HDFS? Yes. Okay. Yes. So if you move it uh, in HDFS, then you get better performance. You could always use it in S3, but since there is no locality of in S3, uh, it, you might not get that good a performance. Mm -hmm. Should sure. people then tend to leave it in HDFS? Uh, so, uh, or, or is it the, the official version is in S3, you run your next job, it re-imports it? So what happens is if you keep your machines alive, yes. then you can keep it in HDFS, right? But if you want to kill your machine instances of the Amazon machines, Yes. So then good thing would be to put it in S3 or um, create summary tables. People actually crunch a lot of data and produce summary tables, uh, which is not that big a size. And then they push it to S3 or their own storage or some other place. <clears throat> when, you, when you mentioned that Yahoo uses the Hadoop for search, do you mean real-time search, so search queries or just... Oh, no. So, so Hadoop, uh, so I will explain uh, that most of the things that I have seen till now, Hadoop is kind of used in the back end. What that means is like you crawl the web and you download all your stuff into a Hadoop file system. Then you index it and reverse index it and do all the stuff. And then create indices and then publish it to some front end databases. And then the search query hits those front end databases. Uh, this is how Hadoop is kind of organized. Uh, most sites, uh, they kind of do a two level hierarchy. Uh, I haven't seen anybody who make Hadoop work across data centers although I plan to work on that area soon. Uh, so right now, most of the clusters are inside one data center, and it's like a two-level rack switch, uh, the typical networking stack. Uh, <clears throat> the goal is to get to like, say, we started off with like a 10 petabyte goal, and now the goal has moved even beyond. It's like 100 petabyte storage uh, in one Hadoop cluster. That's the goal. The biggest I've seen till now is probably around 10 or 15. Um, the f cluster at, at, at Facebook is like six petabytes and like growing very fast. Um, so files are, so the basic goal there is to files are replicated across different machines so that even if a couple of machines fail, you still get, you're still able to access the data. And um, the one uh, difference from other existing file systems, like I had worked with this AFS, NFS, uh, local file systems and stuff like that. There always the thing is that when you're running an application and you want to process data, you open the file and you read data. So the data flows from where the data is to where the application is. Whereas in Hadoop, it's kind of the reverse way. You try to move the application close to where the data is instead of moving the data to where the application is. Because there's so much data to move that you can't move everything over the network. And the goal is to move this computation close to where the data is. Uh, in this number, so it looks like you have quite a big amount of storage per node. It looks like 10, 10 terabytes from those numbers. Uh, doesn't that lead uh, to I.O. bound problems? Yes, so that's interesting. So what has happened is, like I said, uh, many people try to leave their data for long periods of time. So over time, so this is the oldest Hadoop cluster probably is like three years old now, right? So what I've seen is that there's a lot of data that's old, and they're not as frequently queried. So over time, what I see is that if this trend continues, I think nodes will become bigger and bigger because you, like, even though there are 10 terabytes, 5 terabytes might not be queried every day. It's the remaining 5 terabytes or maybe 2 terabytes are getting queried more frequently. And there's once a query every month which touches the other terabytes. So I see this trend happening. So I think the nodes will grow bigger and bigger in size without impacting other issues in Hadoop. Does it make sense? The average amount of data is that actually used by a single job. Oh, so yeah, so actually that depends on the number of nodes in your cluster. For example, I will talk about the Facebook cluster also. So there, probably one job touches maximum of one terabyte. 
Um, but at Yahoo, it'll be much bigger than this, much, much bigger. It totally makes sense that you make the application close to the data for the locality purpose. But I just wonder, because it's going to be very hard if, if like, some of the data you can see there, many applications run on that, you're going to have a hot spot there. So how to avoid that? Oh, yes. So it's not uh, forced to move to the machine where the data is. The goal is to move it closer to where the data is. So if you, let's say, in the general scheme of things, you have like a three-level network topology. You try to move it closer to the node, but might not be on the same node. It could be on the machines on the same rack. Or in the global scheme of things, it will be machines in the same data center. Am I making sense? So if there is CPU contention on one machine, then it will go to nearby machines. Uh, so you, do, you do have uh, some of the, kind of the node management. Oh, yes. We have a network topology. So Hadoop understands the network topology. Okay. Of course, that uh, you can replicate the data many times so that uh, still maintain the locality. So the question is that when you increase the replication, is, are you able to say that uh, this replicate data will be different rack? Yes. So there's a default policy. The default policy is to put uh, the default policy is to have three levels of level replication, and it's guaranteed to be in two different racks. Right now, all those three replicas. But it's pluggable policy, so you could actually plug in your own policy. <coughs> and this thing runs in user space, so we uh, typically people should be able to run it on like Windows and uh, Macs and other machines. Uh, so that is the kind of the overall design or like the big picture. Um, so here we have uh, this is kind of the metadata um, metadata server, which is one machine, and these are your Slaves. So there are typically like 4,000, 5,000 slaves over here in the slave range. And they talk to the uh, master via some like TCP IP and some, from some, some communication protocol, heartbeats, and those kind of things. And then when the client wants to read a block or read a file, he talks to the metadata server first and he gets a list of uh, block IDs and the machines on which the block resides. And then the client directly goes to read the data from the slaves. This is all TCP IP based on these two networks. So you'd see that the data transfer doesn't happen through the metadata server. It goes directly from the client to the, to the, to the data servers. So in, in this, in this um, terminology in Hadoop, we call this the name node, and we call these the data nodes, which is where the data resides. So how many copies of, of each data in your the data nodes? OK, so by default, the replication factor is 3. So if you don't specify anything when you create a file or when you create a data set, it will be replicated three times. But you could change it because when you create a file, you could specify what replication you want. So how do you, what's the protocol for your read and write? On the read, is you read from primary only, or you, you and also write, it can be, you write them all. It's a okay. it's a good question. Strong, yeah. strong consistency. Right. So what happens is, uh, so if you write a file, it actually goes to three different places over here. And then the client tries to get the data from this nearest network topology-wise. So if, you, if, there, if there's a client which is running and the data is on the same machine, on, suppose the client is running on this machine, then it will try to fetch the data from here itself, if there is a copy of the data. If it is not, then it will try to fetch the data from another machine in the same rack. And if it's still not there, then it will go to nearby racks and get the data from there. Did I answer your question? Yeah. You need to commit on the all three, then you Oh, so for writing, yes. So writing is pipeline. So when the client writes, it goes to the first data node. The first data node writes it to the second. Second writes it to the third. Then an act comes back and goes back to the client. So it's a streaming protocol. It's not like send one message and wait. It's like keep sending stuff and keep receiving the acts. Um, but it has to be on all the three data nodes before it's the client, uh, before the client uh, determines that it is right is done. From the point of view of the client, uh, the topology of the cluster is flat. And the client doesn't have any uh, nearby. No, it has. it has. It has, yeah. So that is actually defined. He doesn't really know. The name node tells him uh, that you have to write the data to these data nodes in this order. Because the intelligence is here. He knows the network topology. <clears throat> How frequent are the writes compared to reads? Uh, so, um, so what happens is. Uh, I will present a slide towards the end about a Facebook cluster, and I'll compare how much read and how much write. Do you migrate data between the individual nodes, or do you yes. do it only in case of failure? No, we do migrate. 
so there are some uh, cases where we migrate. For example, if you increase the replication factor, it will mi migrate. Um, if nodes fail, it will definitely migrate. Uh, there is also something called a rebalancer. So I will talk about that also, which actually migrates <coughs> data. So that happens on the fly underneath the client? Yes. The client is smart enough to... Correct. No, the client is not smart enough to do that. So the client has logic to uh, retry some of those algorithms. So what happens is the client doesn't have any locks in the sense that the, once the client has a list of block IDs and locations, the metadata server has no idea that this client is reading from this file. This is, this is done to kind of enable scalability to some huge number. And since if you have three replicas of data, uh, a client tries the first one. If it doesn't, it tries second, third. And if it still doesn't find anything, then it re-requests the name node one more time. <coughs> Uh, so one simplicity or, or one, uh, one thing that we did in the beginning uh, was to make this thing simple and compared to other file systems I've developed where older file systems we used to like page data, metadata from the disk. So you have like a small subset of metadata in memory and when you need to read more metadata you read it from the disk. Uh, whereas in Hadoop it's not that case, all metadata is in the name node memory. So uh, there's no like, the name node doesn't have to do reads and writes of files, uh, of the local files when it is serving requests. Question? Is using uh, Zookeeper? Is no, we're not using Zookeeper yet. Okay. Uh, some people are working on a project called Bookkeeper, which is a layer on top of Zookeeper to make transaction logs of Hadoop go there. But it's not yet part of the Hadoop tree, but it will probably come in another six months or so. <clears throat> mm, so the data node. Uh, which is kind of a dumb uh, slave kind of thing. It doesn't have much intelligence. Uh, all it is doing is like storing some data and validating their CRCs once a while. Like there's policies which uh, lets the data node configure saying that please validate CRCs once every like 15 days or something. The default, all these policies are configurable. So I know people using it different ways. Uh, but these are the main things that the data node does. The data node also periodically talks to the name node and says that these are the blocks I have. Uh, this is kind of a validity check by the name node. Um, <clears throat> uh, so the block placement, uh, some questions about this earlier, is that uh, the default policy is this. So, one, so when, you, when you're writing a file, um, you write data of if the machine on which the client is running is a machine which is a part of your cluster, then it writes one replica to that machine. And then the second replica goes to some randomly chosen remote rack. And the third replica also goes to a machine on that remote rack. Uh, this policy was chosen so that we can cross, we need to cross the top level switch only once. Uh, because you see there are two racks. Um, the, uh, although there are three replicas, we have only two racks. That's the default policy. Um, but there is also uh, code now so you can kind of plug in their own policies. I have known that people and some universities are uh, working on things like, um, so this, this policy is based on network topology, right? As you can very clearly see. Whereas some people are working on like heat map topology and trying to place uh, replicas on machines which are like less heated up or machines which are um, mm, some different characteristics. Uh, like uh, they're using less power, those kind of things. This is all in research, though. The, the, but the pluggable policy is enabling some of that research. Uh, da data pipelining. Mm. So this is when the client is writing data. Uh, the client doesn't write to the three replicas in parallel. It writes to the first replica. The first replica sends it to the second, and the second sends it to the third. <clears throat> Uh, this was done, uh, I remember the early times when we started, we kind of started uh, making the client write stuff in parallel to the three data nodes. And then we quickly figured out that most of the data is generated outside the Hadoop cluster. Um, like whatever data the Hadoop cluster needs to store and process. All the data is kind of generated by somewhere outside, like uh, Yahoo search or like Facebook application now. So instead of having, uh, if you copy, if you make the client write to three places in parallel, you will need thrice the bandwidth from where your data is generated to your cluster. So that's why we adopted this pipelining approach. How are failures handled? As in, I tried to write to the third node and it fails? Oh, yes. 
So right now in the latest Hadoop branch, what happens, or Hadoop trunk, what happens is when you write to these three replicas, if a replica dies, doesn't matter which one, like first one dies or second one or third one, the write continues with the other replicas. And there is a generation stamping mechanism to make sure that the replica that is fallen out is actually detected and not taken into consideration when you're reading. So what that means is if there are three replicas and the first one dies or the second one dies, you continue with two replicas. And then if the second one also dies, then you continue with one. Now things are getting bad, right? And if the third one also dies, then the IO fails right now. I guess I'm confused. If the first one dies, you're not going anywhere, right? Because it's oh, no, so the client, client redirects to the second and the third. Okay. So the IO doesn't fail even if you fail the first replica. But my, the thing though here is that if all the three replicas fail, then the writes will fail. We don't have like uh, replication when the writes are going on. So when the writer is writing, there's no replication for the block happening. Would it also mean that the client has to preserve the data until one of the replicas has committed? Correct. So there's a streaming protocol and there's an ACK protocol. So only when it gets the ACK, it knows which data nodes have the thing. And so then it can get rid from its sliding window. So the client is cognizant of how many replicas it has? Yes. So when This is while writing. So when dynamically you change the number of rep the replication factor. <clears throat> so, so, like, so, so what happens is if a, if, a, if a client is writing to a file, the replication for that file is actually not being maintained by the name node. It's only when you close the file, then it's kind of the name node handles all the replication and fault tolerance. Uh, this might change in the future, future, but right now it is this way. So if, you're, if a client is writing, that file is not getting replicated by the name node at all. It's just the client has to write it to all the three places. Is it, did I answer your question? Yeah. Question? How did you arrive at the number three? Uh, I think um, this we kind of uh, looked at the GFS paper, and also we experimented with replication factor of two. And once in a while, we do see availability issues when we do replication factor of two. So, yeah, I, I'm not very good at like research. So I just kind of ran some experiments to see what works and what did not work. And when we saw two, then many a times we saw like uh, data unavailable, in the sense that some rack switches fail here and there. Um, and uh, the thing is that when you have three replicas and one replica dies, immediately the name node detects this and starts making more replicas. Um, it's not like, so it's very unlikely that all the three replicas will fail exactly at the same time, that kind of thing. So, so in your, your experience has uh, through replicas been sufficient for network locality? Two, ne two replicas? Three replicas. Uh, actually, I think for processing data, two replicas are good enough. Okay. So I've experimented with uh, running queries with two replicas versus three. The difference is like 5%. But for availability purposes, I think three is better. That is my anecdotal experience. Uh, so the name node failure, that's the single point of failure right now. So if the name node fails, your cluster is down. Um, that has happened uh, one time at Yahoo when I was working there. And that has also happened at Facebook once in the last two years I worked there. Uh, so it has happened once in a while. It's not that frequent as people might think, but it does happen. So we'll try to do something to make it better. There are some people working on this thing where you stream all the transaction logs to some other metadata server so that it can pick up the load if the primary dies. What's the role of secondary? The secondary name node? Um, the secondary name node does uh, purging of transaction logs. So like in a file system, right, like you are, you are doing transactions and you write to a transaction log, right? So what I, when you create a file, you write it to a transaction log. When you delete a directory, you write it to a transaction log. Mm -hmm. So the transaction log is growing. So there has to be some mechanism to purge this transaction log and make it part of the base image, right? Typically, file systems, uh, what they do is they have these uh, locks. So another thread will start doing this at the same time when I.O. is happening, right? Uh, but in Hadoop, what happens is we have distributed this. So what happens is the secondary name node pulls the transaction log and the FS image and then merges it into a new FS image, and then submits it back to the primary. Uh, so it's very distributed in the nature in that you don't need like very highly uh, multi-threaded concurrent locking in the name node. So when the, name node, the main name node fails, the second name node cannot take out a job? No. 
Not yet. That's why I said that we need this one, which is actually coming, which is actually going to be like the HS solution. The secondary name node right now is only to purge transaction log asynchronously. Question? You mentioned these uh, uh, failures of the name nodes. Uh, do you know what the cause? Was it hardware yes. or software? Uh, there are two reasons. One was that uh, we were running, so the one at Facebook that I know happened very recent, like a couple of months back, is that uh, the name node keeps all metadata in memory. Uh, so it, it, the amount of memory that the name node needs depends on the amount of files and directories you or blocks you have. So people started creating lots of stuff, and so the name node kind of ran out of memory. So what happens is it started swapping stuff, and things became very slow. So I consider that as like cluster down kind of thing, where people are not getting enough work done. We did not have enough bells and whistles to alert before this happened. So we had to restart name node forcefully with some bigger heap size. That was the one, and in, in Yahoo, I remember what happened is the transaction log device died. Uh, so we keep writing transaction logs to a device, to like a hard disk kind of thing. So we actually have two devices. The first one died, we did not have any alerts. And the second one also died after a couple of months. So those are the two reasons, two ones, valid ones that I know where name node has issued issues. So the metadata is written transaction into, is it backed up? Yeah, so like, uh, so what happens is when somebody wants to create a file, the request comes to the name node. Name node changes its metadata in memory and also writes an entry to the end of the transaction log. That's all. So the name node is only, the only time when name node is doing I.O. is sequentially appending to a transaction log. So it's very fast. It's not doing much I.O. So never like I.O. bottleneck. And you can recreate the metadata from the transaction log when it starts again. If you restart the name node, yeah. So you take the transaction log and you take the original image and merge it together and then start all over again with a zero size transaction log. And that work is also done by the secondary name node because we don't want the transaction log to grow like infinitely. Otherwise, it'll take a long time to purge it and merge it. <clears throat> uh, the rebalancer, uh, this is the question the gentleman asked there. Uh, so the question is when is that, when, when, when are the other times when you try to rebalance data? So right now, there is only one rebalancer that is there in the Hadoop distribution. That rebalances based on usage of, uh, based on disk capacity usage. So it tries to make sure that all the nodes are filled to the same percentage. It doesn't have like, uh, things like, uh, like hotspot detection and making more replicas and those kind of things. Uh, some people are working on it, but right now it is kind of a very rebalancing 101 kind of course, where just make all the data same on all the nodes. Question? When a new file is being created, what's the initial placement policy? Is it just find the one with the lowest disk usage? Uh, no, so first it has, so there's certain constraints. It has to be on two different racks. It has to be, so we try to pick the machines which are least filled on those racks, and also the ones which have least number of IOs going on at the time. Uh, so like if a data node is doing, like say, there are already 10 threads doing IO versus another data node which is just servicing two IOs. Then I try to put it there. But how does the master node, how many IOs are going? So there is a heartbeat from the data node to the name node every three seconds, and that carries this information, how many IOs are currently happening. So it's kind of lagging by three, four seconds, but since the IOs are big size, uh, those IOs tend to go for like five, 10 seconds once a while. So the rebalancer actually works together with the metadata, right? Yes, the rebalancer is actually not part of the name node. It's an external process. So uh, the goal is to make all these things separate so that things continue to work even if some other functionality is missing. So the rebalancer is a separate thing. It's, it started off as a command line utility that somebody can run, um, but right now it's being turned into a metadata. It's kind of a daemon now. So you can actually run it, uh, but people have run it as a cron job once every day. But now you also need to update the metadata, so does it, when the rebalancer runs, does it slow? Reads and writes. Uh, good question. I actually haven't run any performance benchmark there. It could potentially. Uh, the reads, uh, the only thing it could uh, maybe affect is the reads. The writes kind of happen, uh, you, well, yeah. if you're talking about IO bottleneck, then yeah, if the disks are bottleneck because of rebalancing, then oh, there the, could the be. The metadata node. Um, the metadata node actually doesn't, uh, when, a, when a block moves from one data node to another, the metadata node just needs to update its memory. It's not in the transaction log. Am I making sense? 
So the block replication, the, the, the block locations are not part of the transaction log on the name node. This is that's an interesting question actually that you asked. The reason is because there are too many blocks in the system and they're constantly moving around. So I don't want to record anything persistently on the name node. So when you restart your cluster, all the data nodes talk to the name node and say that these are the blocks I have. Uh, so the block locations are not persistent on the name node. They're all in name node memory. Uh, so the Hadoop MapReduce, uh, this is uh, kind of a layer on top of uh, Hadoop file system. Uh, I'm not going to go to great depths into this one, but I guess many people might already be familiar with the MapReduce paradigm. So the paper, uh, the MapReduce paper kind of explains in like maybe more complex terms, but uh, this is the common uh, design pattern that we have seen in many applications, like, like cat, grep, sort, and then put it with a file. And so these grabs can be done in parallel, and these reduces, and this uniqueness and uh, aggregation could be done in parallel, and that's what we call kind of MapReduce. Do you want me to explain a little bit more about MapReduce? I was just planning to skip stuff. <laughs> skip stuff, yeah, right. So I, I guess that everybody knows about it, so I don't want to go to these basics. Um, so well, MapReduce and storage. So there's a very clean API in the Hadoop uh, MapReduce uh, layer and the Hadoop storage layer. So I have seen people uh, take the Hadoop MapReduce layer and plug it to work on a database, like um, SQL, MySQL databases. Uh, so instead of using Hadoop file system, they store all the data in Hadoop uh, in MySQL databases, and they still use the Hadoop MapReduce layer. Uh, they also, like, you can store all the data in, like, IBM is experimenting with this GPFS thing, where actually they store the data in GPFS, and the Hadoop MapReduce layer still works well. So that has actually proven that the API has been kind of uh, pretty good in that sense. It lets you work with different storage stacks and different computing stacks. And I know of like three different startups in the Bay Area who are working on taking the Hadoop MapReduce stack and making it work on their own, stero own storage stack um, to make it work better than Hadoop. <clears throat> mm. So schedulers, I think right now the Hadoop scheduler, the job scheduler is kind of very elementary, it doesn't do many things, and there's a lot of work to be done in that area. I'll just keep there. So Hadoop at Facebook. Um, so this is kind of a typical Facebook page. Uh, just uh, how many, do you guys use Facebook, anybody? Oh, so a lot of people use, so good. So this is kind of the feed stuff that is coming about from your friends. Uh, and then this is um, like the suggestions that whom you might add as a friend. So this is kind of a recommendation system that runs purely in Hadoop, this part. Uh, then, of course, the advertisements run purely on Hadoop. This is the advertisement part. And this is the highlights, which talks about, which kind of looks at different trends and mm, like uh, the items that people have highly recommended earlier, those show up in highlights. That's also running in Hadoop. I wanted to show that most of the page is kind of touching Hadoop in the back end. So this part is right now not Hadoop-based. Um, because there is a real-time like an index server where feeds are coming in and trying to create all that stuff. But it stores everything in Hadoop in the back end. So if you have to restart this index server, it still needs to read everything from Hadoop. That's, the gener that's what generates this part. Um, uh, these status updates finally go to Hadoop after a few minutes of latency or a few seconds of latency. So the, most of the Facebook page kind of touches Hadoop uh, and Hive in the back end. Uh, there are like right now, I think last month we reached like 300 million users, uh, active users for Facebook. And most of this data touches Hadoop uh, in the back end in some fashion or the other. I will explain a little, little bit of those. Uh, the photos right now, they don't touch Hadoop, the photos themselves. They go to another open source stack called Haystack. So Facebook uses open source stuff a lot. So you, we, have, uh, we use Hadoop and we have developed this Hive, which is an SQL layer on top of Hadoop. Uh, we use something called Scribe, which is like a log, distributed log aggregation service. That's also an open source project. Uh, we use um, MySQL extensively, uh, like distributed partition databases, many thousands of them. Uh, we, also have, we also started contributing to MySQL development. So we have like two or three developers who are actually contributing to MySQL. Um, we, use, um, we have this photo store system, which is called Haystack, uh, which is also open sourced. Mm. Some other companies have started using that stuff. Uh, and then 
there are many other things that I'm kind of forgetting now, but these are the main ones. Uh, of course, we use also memcache, which is an open source piece of software which kind of, kind of gives you a distributed key value pair. Um, is most of uh, it done in Hive? Yes, uh, I'll present another slide here. So we have like 95% of our users use Hive. So Hive is kind of SQL-ish in the sense that uh, you don't have to write Java programs to do maps, reduces, and all that stuff. And it gives you this abstraction of tables and stuff like that. So I'll have, I have one slide there, which I will probably cover a little bit. So this is the um, statistics that I have. It's kind of a small cluster compared to bigger companies like Yahoo and I'm sure other companies. Uh, so we have like four terabytes of compressed data. We see a compression factor of like five, uh, in general, five or six. Uh, we currently do uh, zzip compression, I think, yeah. Um, and so, so that is the amount of data that you read every day. That is the, the ratio between the reads and the writes. Uh, so four terabytes of kind of writes, and then 135 terabytes of uh, reads every day. And these reads also generate some secondary tables, but those are much fewer compared to these sizes. The sizes of those are much fewer. Mm. And uh, almost every engine, so, uh, so Facebook now has around uh, 250 engineers or so, out of which probably like 70 or 80% people actually use Hive to run queries on, uh, on, on the Hadoop cluster. So it's kind of very data-driven engineering uh, process there. Uh, that's the size of the Hadoop uh, Hive warehouse that we have. Um, that's like 12 terabytes per node we have, uh, and two-level network switch, and like six terabytes or six close to six petabytes of storage. It's not. It's probably like 80% full out of that six petabytes. Do you have benchmark for the relative performance between Hive and just native Hadoop jobs and yes. Hive and Piglet? Yes, I can forward you that link. Yes, we have comparison between Pig. Of comparison with uh, of Hive, we have TPC, TPCH uh, queries. Not all of them run. I think out of the 16, only 12 or something runs on Hive. Uh, and then we also have comparison with the benchmark that Stonebreaker has published. Uh, so this is the typical architecture of the Hadoop system. Kind of the web servers are where our application is running. Uh, it uses this open source software called Scribe, and it puts into these filers. These are like mostly like NetApp filers. So they're like um, probably 40, 50 of them, the big ones. And then asynchronously, we pull data from the filers into our Hadoop cluster. And this is where our jobs run. Uh, they also fetch data from this federated MySQL layer. They're like probably 15, 20,000 of these. Uh, so we pull data, and then we process all the data and publish some summary reports every day or every hour to an Oracle database. So this is where some business analysts kind of consume the data from there. <clears throat> so we've seen that this is kind of a very big cost right now because it's kind of proprietary and this hardware is very costly here. Uh, the reason we have these things is because we need quick l l response times because if these guys are slow, then it traffic backs up and our application is impacted. Uh, so this is how we started, but right now uh, we are trying to get away from all these costly filers and we have actually put in Hadoop clusters over here. Uh, this is configured to be more real time and smaller in size. Um, this is the first um, um, installation, I think, where anybody has put Hadoop in an installation where if it slows down or if it dies, then application, uh, the end application gets impacted. Yahoo has not done this yet. Uh, but Facebook, I think, much smaller company, and we want to try these things to reduce costs. So we have configured this here. Uh, there's like, this is a complex configuration because we have like overlapping clusters. Um, because we have only one name node in one cluster. And we want to make sure that we can upgrade these clusters without bringing down the stuff. So we have like overlapping clusters. Uh, I can give you more description of how we have configured it. But essentially, the same data nodes are, have two heads, two name nodes. Um, so if one name node dies, the other name node continues to run. Mm. So I, I, I have some more write-ups on that if somebody is interested. But Sorry? What is Skype? Scribe is a log aggregation framework. So we have, like, say, 100,000 of these servers. Uh, they get demultiplexed into a few set of files. Otherwise, everybody will be writing to their own files, right? So you have this, it's kind of a uh, max demux kind of thing. You have lots of requests. It's like a streaming protocol. Um, yeah, Hadoop has a sub project called Chakwa, uh, which is also similar to Scribe. 
Um, but uh, I don't know of any like production sites which is using Chakua yet. Uh, so we also recently did uh, things like erasure coding on HDFS. So this is an idea that I actually got from CMU, uh, the PDL guys. They were working on erasure coding on, um, on HDFS. Uh, all thanks to Garth Gibson, who is uh, kind of the prof there. Uh, he published a paper recently, which we implemented in Hadoop. So what happens is Hadoop has these three replicas. Let's say a file with three blocks, A, B, and C, right? Uh, the goal, like I said, right, if you, if you have two replicas, the production jobs don't have an impact. We have the three replicas only for availability purposes. So what happens is uh, his idea is to actually remove this third replica and create a parity block out of that. Uh, so instead of those nine blocks that you saw earlier, now we have only seven blocks. So you kind of decrease the replication from three to like 2.1 or 2.2. In our cluster, we have seen 2.15 is the effective replication. Um, so because production jobs are not impacted, but it's like once a month I see this getting, uh, we have to like unarchive or uh, deep parity. We used to, only once a month we, I see that this parity bit needs to be used to find the block, only if these two replicas are down. So if these two replicas are down, then only we need to use the parity block and get the block back. Uh, so that has helped in like reducing storage costs a lot. This is kind of erasure coding on top of a file system. Whereas most other file systems, you do erasure coding on the bottom. <clears throat> uh, we also have some archival system right now. So many, most of our data is getting old, and they're not like um, being accessed or queried more frequently. So we want to move them into a storage-heavy cluster, uh, where there are a few heads, like maybe 10 nodes, but each node has, say, like 100 terabytes of disk, something like that, because they're not g getting frequently accessed. So we have some archiver in Hadoop, which is part of Hadoop, uh, which kind of moves stuff to an old archival storage. And we have uh, changed Hive to kind of transparently get data from the archive when needed. Question? Is it, uh, do you do any data cleansing? Any data, I go and read all of it and check that all the checksums are still? <coughs> yeah, so the data nodes constantly keep checking checksums. Uh, over here? Is that, a, is that a small part of the workload? Oh uh, yes, that's a very small part of the workload. And typically, in our configuration, we, we have set up to check all data once every month. Okay. So as long as one machine can read his disk once, all his disk in once every month, mm -hmm. he would be okay, typically for our policy. Uh, but that's a good point. If somebody wants more frequent checking, then this might not be most optimal. Back to the other cluster, the one that is closer to the front that you were mentioning before, uh, the one sort of attached to Scribe. You also sort of tune the ratio between storage and nodes. Uh, you're talking about this yeah. one? The Scribe, uh, the this real time one? Hadoop cluster. Yes. Does it still have the same storage to node ratio that you have in your production warehouse? Uh, yes, uh, I think that it is still has this. No, these have actually four terabytes per node. Uh, these have 12 terabytes per node, yeah. And that I think we pick just like that, not based on any kind of big research or trying to figure out what is optimal. Uh, we have like four terabytes here um, just because we happen to have those machines. Oops. Sorry, I have one more slide on Hive, which I wanted to show you because some people might be interested in that Hive thing. Um, Hive is like a, uh, a project that started completely at Facebook, and um, that has allowed a lot of our um, non-engineering folks to kind of use this thing. Let me just scroll down and show you the last slide. Um, yes. So this is kind of the hive architecture. Uh, uh, this is a very high level architecture, but if, you, if somebody has any questions, I can try to explain later. Uh, so that is the storage stack, which I kind of talked about in great detail. Um, and then this is the Hadoop MapReduce layer, and then this is the hive layer. So the hive layer has this abstraction of tables, and you can have fields inside the table, and you have a parser, so when you submit a query, it kind of uh, parsed and then optimized based on the query 
planning that we have. This optimization doesn't take into account physical layouts right now. So it just optimizes based on the query. Um, and then uh, it makes a MapReduce job or a, or a pipeline of MapReduce jobs which uh, finishes and returns results back to the user. Uh, there's all these pluggable things. So you could look at the same file based on different serialization and deserialization formats. So the same file uh, could be interpreted differently by different queries. Question? Model instead of a batch system, as in I submit a query and sometime later I get results back, or is it more real time? Uh, so, if you submit a query, it will return you back the results, but it might be a while, right? So, because it depends on how big your query is. If you are querying like two terabytes of data, then it might be a while. Uh, whereas, if you are querying very few files, then it's very quick. So, uh, I don't, I don't think there's one answer to that question, but most people. Um, uh, but like I said, there's no like uh, real-time application which is making a Hive query and waiting for it to finish before it can show results to an end user. Do you have some mechanism to ensure that users don't uh, create stupid Hive queries that will bring down the system? Yes, so that has happened a lot uh, in the beginning, right? When I started Hive, people think that, oh, this is very easy. They click here and button and submit, and then it kind of hanging to submit more and more, and a lot of suddenly some big queries running in the background, right? <laughs> this is like a typical, <laughs> this has been the first problem. So, so we have a web UI uh, through which users submit queries. Are you sure you want to? <laughs> so there we do some quick validation on the previous queries that they have submitted because it remains, retains some history. So it's not part of Hive per se, but it is in the UI framework that we have built, which is not open sourced, which is not part of Hive, the UI. Hive with Pig and uh, HBase. Um, so Pig and Hive, I think um, they're exactly the same. The problem or the um, or the or the angle that have that they have adopted to solve the problem is kind of the same. It is just that if you have, for my personal experience is that I have like done a lot of programming C, C plus plus, Java, and all this. So I like Pig a lot, just programming perspective. But I've seen a lot of people who have done programming in SQL or more declarative languages, and they like Hive a lot. So I think it all depends on who is the user uh, for Pig and Hive. That is my question. Both of them can solve the same problem with the same amount of um, performance, I think. I mean, there could be implementation differences, but there's no like, architectural difference there. It's very query difference there. Uh, one difference is that Hive has come from a very warehouse kind of background. So when you put data, it's automatically partitioned into these things. Whereas Pig has come more from a programmatic style background. So they first develop a query up before, and you, they leave it entirely up to you to design your warehouse. Whereas Hive have a lot of things to get your warehouse already built in. It has a meta store, for example. It has typical um, serialization and deserialization formats for most use cases. When you load data, you can quickly say load partition by date, and it will partition by data automatically. So it's a very um, warehouse kind of background. Mentioned declarative programming. So, what do you, are you familiar with, and what do you think of the Boom project at Berkeley, where Joe Heatherstein yeah. working at, you know, declarative yeah. programming for not not just you know user level things, but even like you know like a storage system like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I think that has a lot of scope. User level thing, I think it is difficult because uh, to make people write to a new app, API, I think it's a very difficult um, proposition. But for a, a software stacks themselves, they could use that API to do things better. I agree. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. Um, so any thoughts, questions, suggestions, uh, opinions? Uh, I see that there's a lot of, like, it kind of triggers a lot of conversations. Yes. So I, I, uh, I like the slide that you showed earlier about what are, what are people using Hadoop for at different companies and things like image and video processing I thought were uh, quite an interesting application of it. I guess I'd love to just hear more, uh, any more thoughts you have on that beyond what you already said when you, uh, when you spoke okay. to that slide. Sure, yeah. So um, let me give you some ideas that I have in my Facebook context. Um, none of these are like kind of approved ideas. But the, the thing that most in Facebook, uh, ideas happen from the ground up. So you kind of try to hack something up and show that it works. And if more and more people work, then it gets to the Facebook application and becomes a real feature. So one of the things, the ideas that I have is to put all these photos that people upload into Hadoop 
And then uh, there are some open source um, facial recognition uh, software that I would like to run and uh, not identify the person, but identify that there are faces or there are like uh, well-known locations or like say, um, like, oh, what should I say, the space needle, like a lot of people are putting that photo there. And I would I, I like to uh, engage users to tag them uh, so that there is more conversations about photos that they upload. And I think that this kind of application is very easy to write. Um, uh, the other things I have seen is that there are some people at Stanford who are uh, taking like pictures from these um, hidden cameras in these uh, forests and they take lots of pictures when like animals cross and stuff like that and they need a lot of processing just to figure out which photos they should look at uh, versus all the hundreds and, fo hundreds and thousands of photos that they take. Um, so they are trying to write some pattern recognition software again on Hadoop to figure out interesting photos. Um, beyond that, um, New York Times has some of this cool stuff. Uh, they also do some of this analysis of blogs and photos uh, and kind of see trends. Uh, there is another company called Z Events. Um, they use Hadoop to kind of um, create heat maps of new products, like say the iPhone is shipping and they look at all the blogs and they crunch all these blogs to find out which areas in this country has like uh, more conversation about iPhones, uh, which areas are less, uh, have less convert, those kind of things. Um, beyond that, I, there are many, but I, I don't remember them right off the bat now. You had some question? Yeah, um, uh, my question is mainly about, um, I've heard about uh, some doubts around uh, using <coughs> MapReduce as a backend for SQL like words, especially when it comes to big joints of tables and things like that. Uh, are you guys considering sort of enhancing the schedule? You mentioned deck based schedules and things like that. Uh, is this something that Hive could take or are you guys considering that? Uh, no, I think it, it could be Hive, but I would rather have it as a separate part, right? Because it has nothing to do with Hive in general. Um, but um, many people in Facebook and our company have started asking for running kind of MPI kind of jobs, whereas um, Whereas in MapReduce, you run like mappers and the mappers send output to the reducers. Whereas these guys have programs where mappers want to communicate with one another and try to get some more like some um, convergence of some algorithms before they write out stuff. So it's very more MPI kind of style there. And um, I, we haven't started focusing on it, but I know that uh, the University of Berkeley, though some of the guys there are working on something called Nexus. Uh, that is an MPI scheduler. Uh, based on Hadoop, uh, some core Hadoop framework, but not the MapReduce framework, of course. So, but we haven't been following it up much yet. Gotcha. So, one of, one of the big attractions of uh, the system that you have built is that it reduces programming complexity for uh, these kind of people who want to write Facebook applications. But my understanding is that these people still have computer science background or computer engineering background, right? So what I wonder is, what is it, what will it take to say, make my brother become a programmer? My brother is an engineer, but he's not, doesn't have computer science. Or for example, you know, my mother become a programmer who doesn't have any engineering background. What will it take to make that happen? And, and, I think and you imagine send them that- send to engineering uh, school. <laughs> you can send them to engineering school. <laughs> no, sorry, that was a joke. So, I think at Facebook we have very different types of users. So most of them are data scientists <coughs> who have um, not an engineering background but like a math background or things like operation research background, right? Uh, so they know how to write Fortran. And now they have also picked up Hive because it's very SQL-ish. It's easy for them versus a Java program to write. But we also have like uh, say our person sitting in the reception, right? That lady, she also runs Hive queries because uh, she's actually a person who also does uh, spam detection. So what happens is when people, uh, people um, co complain about this account and that account, she can run a very simple Hive query. This is like a web UI, right? Click Hive query saying that, uh, tell me, find out um, if this account is really bad kind of thing. And that actually starts the whole bunch of MapReduce jobs in the background and finally gives her some results. Um, so I think to answer your question, it's more kind of a API there or what kind of usage you give. Um. 
Question? So the original uh, GFS, they are uh, uh, very highly tuned for a pen only operation. Yes. But there's also a lot of update in the graph. Uh, so last time I checked that the uh, Hadoop DFS uh, was basically dry ones and read only. And I have heard that there's some, some idea to push into the GFS standard. So what's your comment about it? Uh, so let me understand your question correctly. So I think what you're asking is that uh, GFS has append. Uh, uh, no, GFS is appends, but they have, but multiple guys could be appending to the same file. Whereas Hadoop and the latest branch of Hadoop, uh, we have appends, but only one append. So only one writer can be appending to a file. We haven't seen an application where multiple guys are appending to the same file. Uh, so I kind of uh, don't want to design that unless it's really required because it makes things very complex, or much more complex. One appender is very much more easier to, to implement. Um, but I guess if there's a use case, we could we could do something over there. One of the use cases is that because in, in the search engine you have a a all the clusters, mm -hmm. and all the clusters they may be append sending the data to the same file. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason for multiple appended. Right, but you could also send it to multiple files. Right, very simple solution. Because if you write if the GFS has a has a shortcoming. So if there are two writers writing to the same file, the same record could be duplicated. And the application has to handle the fact that the record appears twice in the file. Right? They very clearly mention that. So applications have to have some complexity to deal with multiple uh, duplicate records. Whereas if application writes it to two different files, that case doesn't arise. But the application has complexity that it has to deal with multiple files. So I don't know which is better, but both, of, both approaches can be taken. And the original Google paper, they also mentioned that they can do update in the graph, even though it is not optimum operations. No, the GFS stuff, they don't let updates to a block. Uh, well, we can check you could it. truncate or append. So w only thing you could do is truncate back mm -hmm. and make it shorter, and then start appending again to that file. But you cannot like change bits in the same block. Because the, the, thing, the reason I think they did it is that once a block is complete, it's kind of replicated in many places. And so it's very difficult to update a data block in the middle because you'd have to upload all these replicas at the same time when they're moving around. Uh, I have a question about the data analysis. Since you mentioned that there are many data scientists doing the work, so do you know any scientific uh, competition on top of Hadoop? For example, solving large linear system or manipulating metrics? Uh, yes, manipulating matrices uh, actually need like some kind of an MPI kind of uh, solution there, right? So all our data scientists have written a lot of Python code to handle some of that. So that's right now outside of the Hadoop framework. But there is a Hadoop sub-project called Mahout, M-A-H-O-U-T. Uh, so some people outside of Facebook have started this like matrix calculations uh, based on a Hadoop framework. Uh, we don't use that yet. So ours is very custom built and kind of uh, some software that our team has built. So, so you mentioned that you know you have a mini Hadoop cluster and Facebook are kind of dealing with uh, queries with more real time mm. implications. Mm -hmm. uh, so, do you have any thoughts on that apart from just kind of you know scaling this down to make it kind of more real time? Oh no, I think the know? biggest problem there was to get HA. So you have like say 100 machines there, right? We have one name node. And this is a real-time cluster. What it means is that we, if we shut down this cluster, the application traffic will get impacted. So we, the way we've configured is that there is a two data node ap application running on each machine, two data node instance. And they're actually reporting to two different name nodes. They're sharing the same storage. And so we have built Scribe so that if it's not able to write to one name node, then it writes to another name node. And, um, um, then we've run, write, written some copiers, which actually copies data from the real-time cluster to our main cluster asynchronously. Um, so that overlapping clusters idea, it's not really a foolproof HA, because if a cluster is down, you cannot read its data. Uh, but at least Scribe is able to keep writing data to the other cluster. So it's HA for writes only kind of thing. Um, so it's kind of a stamp gap solution until we get real HA in, in Hadoop. Any it's other question? Go. Thank you. Thanks a lot.